Welcome to the second webinar of the first ever webinar series by the Newton Conservators. As most of you probably know, Newton Conservators is a nonprofit established in 1961 and works to preserve and to maintain open space in Newton. For more information about the organization, check out our new website at newtonconservators.org. My name is Beth Wilkinson, and I'll be the moderator of this virtual event. Barbara Bates will provide the technical assistance. Let's turn to the important part of the evening. Listening to Eric Olson tell us why we need to be concerned about the proliferation of invasive plants. Eric recently retired from Brandeis University, where he taught field biology and other courses for many years. Dr. Olson has a lifelong interest in insect-plant interactions, with particular interest in moth, butterfly, caterpillars, and their host plants. He has led dozens and dozens of invasive plant control sessions in both Newton and Waltham. Most recently, he was responsible for installing a wonderful handmade information kiosk in Cold Spring Park. There is so much more to tell you about Eric's work, but let's hear directly from him. Welcome, Eric. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time in your evening to, to join this uh, presentation, watch this presentation, and learn a bit more about invasive um, plants. Um, I'm going to just jump right in and share my screen of my presentation. So I hope everyone can see my screen. Okay, so the, the uh, this, this presentation is uh, based on a, a talk I gave to the Waltham Land Trust uh, repeatedly uh, as part of a training program on stewardship in their parks. I've modified it a bit for this talk because um, you're going to have another chance to hear from another person who has been working on invasive plants for many years. That's Bruce Winning. And um, I think at the end of our talk, uh, Beth will give you a summary of upcoming talks. So, and Bruce is uh, uh, really trained in landscape management and horticulture. And his talk will emphasize more the removal methods. I'll touch on that a little bit, but um, mainly my uh, assignment here is to uh, try to answer the question, why? are we concerned about invasive plants? And you know, to sort of motivate more folks to get out there and, and help us steward our parks and um, keep them from being too overrun by invasive plants. So the first thing, this is actually a couple slide introduction before we start, because I just have to address the question about uh, invasiveness and what makes a plant invasive and uh, make the distinction. This is really important. I want to make the distinction between the what we call in botany the alien species, the non-natives um, that have arrived over the years by accident or on purpose from uh, around the world, uh, uh, mostly Europe and uh, and and but part but certainly from East Asia as well. And so. Um, uh, and I start with this picture right here. You, you probably recognize that. It's known as Queen Anne's Lace. It is the uh, origin of carrot. And uh, it's a non-native. And yet it rarely becomes really uh, so common in a patch of meadow that it deserves a little, you know, cut back. <laughs> Heck, the common milkweed can do that too. The common milkweed can be quite a bully, as one gardener I know puts it. And so um, we're in in uh, in our in our aim for fostering diversity in our gardens or in our meadows and in our parks. Even our native species can be somewhat uh, aggressive at times, and 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 we might even consider them in some settings invasive. But in general, the invasive species we're dealing with are non-natives, and. Um, and this distinction is important because um, there's, there's an amazing number of non-native species in Massachusetts. This is a survey that was done by the state botanist. Did you know we have a state botanist? And uh, in 2009, the state botanist found uh, 1,700 species of um, native plants and 1,300 species of introduced 
Now this included everything like, you know, petunias and so on that don't uh, survive outside of our gardens. And so in 2011, they made a distinction and they said there's uh, 898 species of plant that do survive outside of our gardens that are not native to the, to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They found 1,800 species, that, that went up, 1,800 species of plant are native to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So if you ever wanted a challenge, start learning uh, the Latin names of, of that many. Oh boy, good luck. And then, um, and the, but 898, or in other words, 33% of the plants that you encounter in the Commonwealth today are not native to this, uh, to this region. And, and so the 898, but you, you think about the number we actually deal with when we deal with invasive plant, you know, control efforts. It's just a handful, five, you know, six, seven, maybe there might be, I don't know, some 20 species on the invasive plant list of the state. But in, in Newton, we're only dealing with a small handful. And so I, you can almost consider this a biological enrichment. And I love dandelions. They're not native. I love gar um, uh, uh, the uh, Queen Anne's lace. And, and believe it or not, uh, our black swallowtail butterfly lays its eggs on our Queen Anne's lace now and then. And so some plants are not only um, not being overly aggressive, they're actually supporting our local insects to some extent, although our native plants always do a better job of that. And so uh, this just reminds me to say that these slides will be available and there's more, you know, some of what I say sometimes um, is written here where we don't have to read all this, but just to remind you, if you review the presentation later, what, what some of uh, the details I said. So, so the point here is that we don't care as much about 99% of the non-natives because they generally behave themselves. Just a handful of invasive plants out of 898 species are sometimes problematic. And they include things like, many of you will recognize, uh, garlic mustard, Japanese knotweed, oriental bittersweet, uh, buckthorns, black swallowwort, the shrub honeysuckles, um, winged euonymus, and so on. These. If your favorite uh, invasive plant isn't on the list, uh, uh, sorry about that. But the, the, this is just, just an example. So, um, so please, here in blue is a key lesson. Pushing back against this handful of invasives does not make you an anti-immigrant. Um, uh, you, you know, we've actually been, I've read essays that, that, that say this focus on invasive plants and all the concern about them is sort of a, sort of a nativist, non-anti-immigrant uh, philosophy, and, and that's just not the way to think about it. Um, and so now into the, into the uh, meat of our, of our presentation, why manage invasive plants um, uh, around your home and around town? And so just a little bit about me and the perspective I bring to this. As Beth mentioned, I have this lifelong interest in butterflies and moths, and their life cycles. I grew up in the outskirts of Detroit and I always wished we could live in a place like that. Um, and I just, I just reared caterpillars and, and collected butterflies. And it was just, I started when I was three years old. And I think my dad really got me going on this and it just stuck with me. Inside every entomologist, I think there's a 10 year old boy still. And I guess I'm still a little bit like that. Um, but I did, I went on to college and majored in geology. Then I took a master's in forestry. I did a PhD in Costa Rica. And I began by, um, I studied the, the dietary ecology of a big moth caterpillar. It was just a, a good choice. It was very easy to raise. And uh, I could get large samples of caterpillars to do tests with. And I tested the cat moth caterpillar against 80 species of non-host plants. It grew well on only one, but that one proved to be of interest in my other experiments that I then did. Um, and it really made sense that it only grew on one non-host. We think it was a non-host because it had never been found feeding on that plant in nature. So um, 
And it turns out, you know, we'll talk about this again, most in herbivorous insects are specialized. That is, they only feed on a few uh, uh, plant species. Well, after my PhD, I was funded by Earthwatch. And with Earthwatch volunteers, I studied the community ecology, not one species, the community ecology of plant eating insects in a tropical forest for six years. Now you might say, what? How do you do the community ecology of plant eating insects? It, it, there's too many, it's too vast, right? And so the, you'll see, I did kind of an indirect research project on this, but here's my volunteers. Earthwatch is a fantastic organization. I encourage you to look it up. It's based here in Massachusetts, but sends volunteers to work with scientists all around the world. And um, this was on a day off during our uh, two weeks they would spend with me. And, um, and what we did was we, we uh, set out these plastic sheets on uh, grids in the forest, 240 of these plastic sheets divided up across eight different sites. And we collected the poop. Yep, that's right. I studied insect poop for six years. I know it's, it's bonkers. But uh, it allowed us to track the abundance of insects feeding in the canopy and map that against uh, rainfall and map it against uh, certain predators that were also, um, we were also able to track uh, wasps, ants, spiders, um, and it really gave us a good uh, phenology of the comings and goings of the insect world in this tropical forest. So yes, I, I, we studied the community, but rather indirectly through, uh, through this, this collection. So we knew the size of the trap, and we knew the amount of frass that we were collecting per, um, per day, and we weighed that to, you know, incredible precision of uh, hundreds of a gram. And so we could calculate uh, how much, how many kilograms of insect frass was falling, insect poop was falling per hectare. And then you can back calculate based on the um, efficiency of a caterpillar, you can figure out um, the percent of, in, of leaf matter that was consumed by insects in a year. So you know the mass of fallen leaves, that was by another study that was collecting, uh, ass assessing all the leaves that were produced in a year. Uh, I was working out how many uh, leaves were consumed by insects because I could back calculate from the frass, con frass fall. That gave us the total leaves produced. And guess what? The percent of leaves that are eaten by the herbivorous community of insects is 12%. 12% of the leaves produced in a tropical forest in a year are, are, are consumed. And this turned out to be exactly the same percent found in other forests, but using different methods. And so plants pay an annual tax to the animals. It's normal. Of course it's normal. We learned this in third grade that you know, the sun goes to the plant, the plant is fed on by some herbivorous animals, they feed the uh, first order of predators, and then the top predator in the area uh, sits atop it all. And so we refer to these as the trophic levels. And so um, insect eats plant, and then this means leaf damage happens. So when you see leaf damage in, in, a, in your garden or in a forest, that's a sign of a healthy food web. Um, and like I say, my result turned out to be right in the middle of um, the sort of the tax rate discovered by other ecologists elsewhere. Leaf damage is normal. And so an artist I met uh, had produced this drawing of an oak leaf and it just tells us that inside every one of those little holes, somewhere there's a happy insect that, uh, that got a bite. Um, and really only these insects can produce, can make this, this wonderful transition of a low grade, uh, mostly inedible food to most animals into this high value protein and fat that is a caterpillar or a grasshopper or katydid or something like that. 
uh, and and the, the, the diversity of insects feeding on plants is greater than most folks realize. A third of all the beetles, 100% really of the butterflies and moths, there's a fair number of uh, wasps that feed on plant. The, the sawflies, that's not known very well by most folks. The, the true flies have leaf miners. Um, the hemipterans are almost entirely herbivorous. That's the aphids, the leafhoppers, the cicadas, and so on. Grasshoppers and katydids are essentially 100%. Rips and then the wonderful stick insects, the walking sticks, are 100% herbivorous. So, so this, uh, this feeding group is very diverse, and I think most of us think of caterpillars, but, but here you see the, the diversity is, is great. So it's a reminder of how nature works. And then some more basic ecology. As I mentioned, most herbivorous insects are um, very specialized. So these wonderful caterpillars, which start life looking like a bird poop. I, uh, this is not, I'm not joking. This caterpillar sits on the top of a leaf and, it, and, it, and it's a bird poop. It's shiny and wet looking with black and white. It just looks to a bird like, yuck, you know, who would want to eat that? And then it can transition into this wonderful snake mimic, one of the best caterpillars in New England, uh, a Pokemon character in a sense, you know, the, the, the spice bush swallowtail. And it, unless you have spice bush or sassafras in your park, you won't see these. That, that's the kind of tight relationship that this uh, species has. And what a gorgeous butterfly it is. And of course, we all know the story of the monarch and milkweed. And this means, of course, that, that the, the, the females, once they've mated, they need to hunt. They need to search for hours, days, as long as they live and have eggs to lay. They're search, they're search engines. They're just, you know, that's their job, is to find the exact correct plant. The spicebush female is going to be looking for spicebush or sassafras and nothing else. The monarch will be looking for milkweeds and nothing else. So why, why does, why did it make, why, why has the, have the gods of nature made it so hard? The world is filled with plants. Why do these butterflies and moths have to work so hard to find their exact right plant? Well, well, one reason, of course, is plant chemistry, and the monarch is a wonderful example of that. It's feeding on a plant with cardiac glycosides. You know, if you, if you did get somehow enough milkweed latex in your stomach, your heart would start to go pitter-patter, and, and it's, it's a toxic plant. So very few insects know how to deal with it, but once the monarch mastered it, what a great trick. It was able to keep the poisons in its body as a caterpillar. It makes its caterpillar very conspicuous. That's like, don't eat me. Look at the black, yellow, and, and, and black bands. That isn't trying to hide. That's more like trying to shout out, I will make you sick to every bird uh, around. And then the poison is contained in the chrysalis. And then when the adult emerges, it pumps the poison into its wings and it retains it in the body. And so the poison of the plant, which makes it so hard for m most insects to feed, on that plant is actually becomes the defense of the insect. So of course this butterfly will become specialized. It's gaining wonderful value from its host plant and it's, um, uh, and then um, others that are not poison uh, feeding and not able to retain any poison uh, are going to become specialized because they blend in so well. So it can be very beneficial uh, since you're such a, you know, a target for, for predators to exactly match your background. And if you are a match to a goldenrod flower, the advantage to that may come to such a point that the female no longer looks, looks for other uh, uh, plants to lay her eggs on. She simply waits until the goldenrod has flowers and then she lays eggs because her caterpillars have such a higher survival rate on that special plant. And so uh, we, we come to this question, you know, uh, how do we convince the world that B, <laughs> with its damage, gardeners don't really like to see this, right? They like to see the, some, many gardeners. It's changing. 
how do we convince the gardeners of the world that B is better than A? If you learn to see our parks and gardens ecologically, then this no longer looks, um, uh, get, it no longer is, makes you, you know, is dismaying. It's, it's a cheerful sight. Uh, that it tells you that the that 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 they you you have a little ecosystem that you're stewarding there. You see um, more butterflies. You'll see more birds with um, feeding on on plant matter. And so this brings us to the native the net the the invasive plant problem. Uh, this scene, of course, uh, it first shows you that this garlic mustard is growing and essentially excluding our native plants by its prolific display. But look closer. Uh, next spring, as you walk in our parks, try to find a leaf with chewing on it. In some cases, you'll see a hole in a leaf or something, but twigs will fall and produce holes in leaves sometimes too. So try to find some serious chewing on the garlic mustard. You can chew it, it kind of tastes fun, you know, you can put it in salads, but but insects rarely uh, are able to touch it. Um, remember, leaf damage is the norm. And so seeing this sort of pristine, almost like plastic plant is weird. And when it comes to dominate, well, the whole, the whole trail side is basically planted in plastic. Um, Japanese knotweed, uh, that is another very aggressive plant that can displace our natives. And so competition, of course, is why we should worry about it. But what I'm trying to do is give you the food web view of this. Um, uh, these children did escape, you'll be glad to know. They were not lost to that massive Japanese knotweed. And, but try to find um, damage on the Japanese knotweed. It, here, you can find this still today in September. Walk around looking at Japanese knotweed, and it's been a leaf since, you know, May, right? May, June, July, August, almost five months sitting out there in nature. Uh, I, I, let me know if you find any insects feeding on it uh, routinely. After five months, it just sits there. Uh, Asiatic bittersweet, here you see a little rip, you know, in the leaf with wind or a stick that fell or something. That's, that's not feeding. Uh, it's rare to find a caterpillar of any sort or grasshopper feeding on Asiatic bittersweet. And so this is, this is, this is the motivation for me. You know, imagine a stream uh, uh, in Cold Spring Park or something where uh, the shrubs and the natural plants are covered over in invasive vines and, 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 and we've lost our, um, our food web, not just our native plants, but the food web is, is truncated. Um, and so uh, I think if Mark Rudnick is listening in, I hear he has this question, you know, he might be asking this question. So wait just a sec. Who knows that saying about nature and unused space or resources? Um, you probably have heard nature abhors a vacuum. And, uh, and boy, what a vacuum we have in the context of tons. Yeah, tons. I mean, look at this. Think of how many tons of leaves are in this and then imagine that over the space of a hectare or acre or something. So we're talking tons. Um, uh, won't some native insects colonize these host plants quickly and bring them under control? Well, I studied geology in college, so you know I have a little different point of view on quick <laughs> than most folks. So yeah, maybe quick. Um, you, you know, the, the world is 4,500 million years old, so in a million years is pretty quick. But um, there's actually an answer to this question. There's a classic book on insects and plants um, by Donald Strong, John Lawton, and Sir Richard Southwood, and they wrote a chapter on uh, community patterns through time. And they were really interested in invasive plants. They were actually insect people, but they were interested in this colonization. You know, a new plant arrives in England or, or Australia. That's where they were doing their studies. And, and, and it's never been part of the ecosystem before. And it asked, you know, they asked the question, do native insects in those nations 
evolve to feed on this new plant and how quickly. So they're looking, they, they found data. How long ago had a plant arrived in this new land? You know, they found examples of 10 to 10,000 years after a new plant arrived to an islander continent. And for thousands of years, humans have been moving plants around intentionally or unintentionally. And so they're kind of like ecological experiments. And they found that yes, insects do colonize new plants in their environment. Uh, they found in, in uh, butterfly bush had arrived from China to uh, England in 1869. And 15 insect species are known to nibble on it. Common rhododendron from Bulgaria, 11 species. Blackberry from Europe to Australia, 41 species. But when you look closer at the mixture of species, what you find is that many of the insects that colonize a newly introduced plant are called polyphagous. That is, they already feed on a wide range of plants. And so remember that most insects are specialized. And so most of the insect biodiversity requires specific plants. Um, some insects are able to feed on a wide variety of plants. Um, in in, in, an, in an, another finding was that not all species of introduced plants recruited insects, despite being exposed to attack for many years. The prickly pear cactus has been in Africa for 250 years and not a single African insect can feed on it. The main finding was this colonizations, if they do occur, are usually rapid. The high rate of insect acquisition is rapid at first and subsequently slows to a trickle. And so these generalist insects, they have plenty of food already and they are not particularly in danger by, you know, having their plants replaced by uh, non-natives. But the specialized insects are, uh, are at risk and so they're the, and they are the majority. So here's another example from Doug Tallamy, and he's a wonderful resource. You ought to find his book, Bringing Nature Home. And he shows, you know, Clematis, 40 species supported in the homeland, and in North America, one. Years in seduction, 100. Eucalyptus, 48, one. Melaleuca, 409 species in the homeland, eight in North America. 120 years of living in our country, and so on. And so, you know, you can see the, uh, see the problem here. Yes, there, there, you, you will get some adaptation over time and the new plant will eventually, I mean, it, it, it seems to be quite rapid. Eventually, I assume that over millions of years, yeah, some insects are gonna figure it out and evolve to feed on that new plant. But it's, it seems like, uh, real, real uh, insect fauna uh, uh, colonization of a plant takes a long time. So let's get to another question. Any evidence that invasive plants harm food chains? Well, someone once remarked about ecology is that it elucidates the obvious. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the uh, inedibility of these plants and, and, you, and you see how some of them can become so dominant in an environment, it's pretty uh, likely that they're doing some kind of interference to the food chain. But Talamy and students, they look, you know, that's a scientist want to see the data. And so they looked not just at the diversity of insect species, but from the bird point of view, what matters is the number, right? If you're trying to feed babies in a nest. And then we'll talk about Blossy and his friends at Cornell. And they did a, they interviewed frogs. It was great. So what Talamy looked at he collected um, caterpillars on uh, native plants and then alien plants. And he found dramatic differences in biomass. This is milligrams per gram of leaf on uh, a variety of native versus alien non-native plants. That's pretty striking uh, data there. And then um, he also looked at the species variety uh, the diversity of insects on native versus alien plants. And, and this is, again, a strong, uh, strongly significant result with uh, caterpillar diversity on native versus alien. And then they did this wonderful study where they looked at 
birds and butterfly diversity in suburban landscapes where they gained access to these uh, estates. And some people had, had asked the landscapers, oh, plant whatever you want, you know, and the landscapers at the time, and it's to some extent still today, tend to favor the usuals, you know, the yews and the not necessarily the native rhododendrons and and they 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 fill up the landscape of a of a nice estate with non-native plants. Other people are attentive to this and they plant more native species. So they had these two different kinds of estates and they looked at a whole bunch of each of them, like eight or ten of each, and they found dramatic results. They found that native properties supported significantly more caterpillars, significantly more caterpillar species and significantly greater bird abundance, diversity, species richness, biomass, and breeding pairs of native bird species. And they noted a particular importance is that bird spe species of regional conservation concern were eight times more abundant and significantly more diverse on native properties. So that was a, that was a very compelling um, study. And you know, what's going on? Birds feed their babies caterpillars. Even seed-eating birds, when they have babies in the nest, like the cardinal with its seed-crushing bill, will switch to feed babies caterpillars. There's just no better food. Try it sometime. You'll, be you'll believe it. No, I mean, they're rich in, they're rich in protein and lipid, and, and they're soft and squishy, very easy for, cater for baby birds to to uh, to digest and so you know the diversity of warblers that feed on caterpillars and the seed eating birds even the grosbeak will switch to feed on caterpillars when it has babies in the nest um, they're the particularly preferred uh, herbivorous insect but you know they're 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 they're, they're all kinds of herbivorous and yes I ask kids you know and when I go into school sometime finish this sentence, baby birds eat, and they always say worms. And of course, yes, some birds do feed their babies worms, but the, here's a robin feeding a caterpillar to its baby bird. So um, caterpillars, caterpillars. Uh, this was a neat study not so long ago that looked at um, uh, what, what plants were the birds feeding on? That is, did they go to any old plant to look for caterpillars? It found that they found that oaks really delivered the major chunk of the Carolina chickadees insect intensive diet in this in this study and um, uh, and they counted mom and dad chickadees must find 7,000 caterpillars to raise five baby birds now you know in suburban Washington DC they uh, looked at for caterpillars on plants and they found um, zero to one caterpillar on nine native, but up to 20 or more on oaks. And oaks nationally are in the lead. There's 557 different kinds of butterfly and moth that lay their eggs on oak. Other really high uh, abundance caterp uh, caterpillar plants are black cherry and maples. If you wanna feed the birds, plant an oak. And of course, they also help prevent too much damage on the trees. And here's a picture just to remind us that it's not just caterpillars. This, this bird has grabbed a damselfly is what it looks like and it manages to catch a damselfly and then pick up two caterpillars on the way home and stuff that into the baby's mouth. It's pretty amazing. By the way, the wasps also protect our trees. I like wasps. They're a caterpillar feeder. Um, they only visit flowers to refuel a little bit on, um, on nectar they're mainly caterpillar hunters. So now let's just look at Blossy, and he interviewed frogs. He um, came up with a brilliant design. He, he, he bought a whole bunch of laundry baskets at Costco, and he put 25 of them in a knotweed patch that was invading this uh, wetland with all of its diversity of plants. And um, so the, the, he put a frog in each one. No frog was harmed in, this, uh, in the making of this experiment. I think one basket was overturned by a raccoon and the raccoon got the frog. But, but the frogs were just kept for about, I don't know, 36 hours or something like that in the basket. And of course, the idea was if, if there's very few bugs in the knotweed, 
the the there are very few bugs will jump through the through the um, squares in the laundry basket, and if there's lots of bugs, um, uh, the frogs will be nicely fed because they're uh, able to see the bugs readily when they jump into the laundry basket, and so they uh, put uh, like I say something like uh, I don't know fifteen or something in each different kind of habitat, and um, they were um, and they were left for thirty six hours. Most frogs in the native wetland vegetation gained weight. No frogs in the knotweed invaded areas gained weight and many lost weight. Most frogs from native plant plots, but only two from invaded plant plots defecated right after removal from the buckets. And poop, of course, was verification of recent feeding. In other words, frogs in knotweed are basically on the way to famine after 36 hours showing you that uh, our, our, our impression of knotweed as lousy insect food uh, is noticed by frogs as well. Um, what else do we know? Well, some invasive plants are actually allelopathic. That is, they put a chemical into the soil that discourages the growth of, um, uh, of native plants. And so garlic mustard in this experiment, let's just look down at this lower chart here, in, um, in uninvaded soil after the months of this experiment, uh, young sugar maples had reached this height, young red maples had reached this height, and white ash seedlings had reached this height in one year. And here in the invaded plot with the garlic mustard having been occupying the soil for some years already, we can see the impact on seedling growth of our native trees. It pretty much is equivalent to sterile. Here they, here they took soils and sterilized the soil in an autoclave, killing all the local fungi and other uh, potential mutualists to our, to our plants. And the invaded, the garlic mustard invaded soils are basically autoclaved, sterilized by the uh, poisons of the garlic mustard, discouraging our uh, native plant tree growth. Um, and you know, how does this work? Well, you probably heard of mycorrhizae. If you haven't heard of mycorrhizae, you need to go on a fungus walk. And um, it's the friendly fungi in the soil that collaborate with our trees, gathering nutrients in exchange for sugar. So just a real quick look at some of the ways we control them. And like I say, Bruce Wenning is going to really go into this I hope you're all inspired now eco eco ecologically to, to, to do a little uh, help stewarding our, our parks and your gardens. And, um, but you know, garlic mustard, you just pull it up, shake off the uh, roots and put it in the trash. Don't compost it because as we've just shown, it has nasty chemicals. Japanese knotweed is tough. I've had a site where we've been working with youth for eight years and I, I swear if we walked away from it, it would probably come back. Um, I have used uh, glyphosate in some cases, injecting the stems, but uh, you have to have a license for that. I was operating under a licensed operator uh, with those experiments, and that worked in one year. So I do have to say I'm not entirely opposed to the use of herbicide in the right setting, and, it, and other native plants came right back in that site, so the glyphosate didn't discourage the natives. Um, Asiatic bittersweet, uh, these are the big vines and what we do is we cut low and cut high. This way when you're walking the trail um, you're sure that the plant has been cut and it might be 20 meters off the trail and you have to if you have to walk over 20 meters to look and to make sure it was cut um, that's kind of a waste of time. So we cut low and cut high and then the other advantage is it doesn't have a, a ladder because it'll re-sprout. The damn thing will re-sprout. So it doesn't have a ladder to climb right back up into the trees. Uh, right away. So cut low and cut high. Black swallowwort, that's eh, a nightmare. I have nothing to say about that. I mean, maybe Beth or, or Barbara or someone else has knows about it, but look at this thing. It, it binds itself to metal fences. How are you going to deal with this? The best we've been able to do is, is, is collect the pods before they spread their seeds. I think this is going to be, I don't know, I, it's it, maybe, maybe herbicide is the answer for that one. Common buckthorn, um, here we are, do have a neat experiment going on in Cold Spring Park where we're winching up. We use a weed winch uh, uh, 
a weed wrench to uh, pull the buckthorn up. And small stems can be pulled up by the roots by hand, but bigger, bigger shrubs need to be wrenched out of the ground. It's um, not easy. But, but what we found is that it doesn't come back uh, too fast. And since it's a shrub, it grows relatively slowly. So you can keep up with it fairly readily. And then you see the list of you know, chemicals you can use that, that, like I say, you have to have a license to do all that. And they're nasty stuff. I mean, some of these are, are bad, bad for you. So it's good to have, um, uh, it's good to have um, this control where you have to have training uh, in concentrated form, irreversible eye damage, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's not good, not, not, not friendly stuff, right? Um, the buckthorn baggie is another method that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, we do have um, people in the parks who see these and think they're being, you know, torturing the plants and they get removed. Maybe someone at the end who has more experience with buckthorn baggy can talk about that. Other plants that are you know, relatively minor invasives, the winged euonymus, weed wrench. The, the, the honeysuckles, uh, weed wrench. English ivy, it, you know, some of these are, I view, I view invasive plants on a spectrum. And some of them are really problematic and need to be uh, dealt with quite quickly. Others, like the English ivy, is not as, uh, as problematic, although locally it can become a very dense ground cover over time. So here's my summary. We have created conservation areas for a purpose. Some people just want to see green and walk their dog. I get that. They really don't care. Uh, what plant they're looking at. They just want to have a place to walk. But for many people, um, it, it, you know, and that's the people I want to, I'm, I have in mind, that our parks can serve as a way of seeing the New England food web and the New England ecological habitats and in, in their intact form, at least modestly intact, you know, we can't bring back the eastern wolf. But um, uh, and we'll never eradicate invasive plants completely, but at least in our conservation areas that have been deliberately set aside at great expense, right? I mean, what's an acre of Newton worth these days, right? I think we can, we can invest some time in the control and management of these plants. It also is just really fun and you learn a lot to get out there with a group of folks. And so partly <laughs> the invasive plants offer us a pretext for getting into our parks and, and, and gardening them a little bit. Um, in doing so, you favor the many million year in evolving relationships between plants and insects, and therefore help the hundreds of species of bird and frog and salamander and toad and praying mantis and so on, spiders. Finally, by doing so with volunteers, we increase awareness of how nature works. And this will translate to their um, private properties. So that's my, um, I think I'll stop there and we'll see if there's any questions. Thank you, Eric. That was absolutely amazing. Okay, I, thank you very much. <laughs> I hope, but I'm sure people have been inspired to go out and learn what the plants are and then maybe to help a group of us take them out. Now let's get to questions from the audience. Uh, Marianne wants to know, is Alanthus, which for those of you who might not know, is Tree of Heaven, allelopathic? Oh, um, I've never heard of any uh, evidence that it's allelopathic. Um, that, 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 uh, that phenomenon of plants using chemicals in the soil to discourage the growth of competitors is probably also on a spectrum. And so garlic mustard seems particularly good at it, uh, particularly bad <laughs> in that regard uh, for our native tree seedlings. But I haven't, I, I haven't heard of Iolanthus as um, problematic in that regard. Okay, thank you. Catherine wants to know whether birds will suffer in the short run if we remove the non-native berries they've been eating? Oh, uh, yeah. So you may think about the honeysuckles and the um, uh, Asiatic bittersweet right now is uh, producing a lot of fruit. 
and it produces fruit right into the winter. The only time I ever saw a lot of birds eating Asiatic bittersweet though were this stock of, of starlings, which are an invasive bird. <laughs> Quite a sight. Um, but in general, there's actually, in, in, there's actually been studies of this about the nutritional value of the common invasive berries. And they're not so great. It's, and, their t and their timing is not right. I can't remember all the details right now, but um, when birds are migrating, they come, you know, they migrate at night uh, to the south, right? They're migrating now in our, in our night skies. And they come down to ground in, in the day and they're looking for refueling on insects and berries. And the non-natives apparently are not as uh, useful in, in, in the energy uh, content as our native berries. So there have been studies on some of this. In, in, in general, I wouldn't worry about the harm to birds. They, they have, they, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I heard a study, uh, particularly about burning bush, that birds see the red, red says eat me, and they fuel up on it, and it's very low in fat and nutrients they need, and they sure. take off to migrate, and they don't have the nutrition they need. Okay, so they, they feel full, but they don't actually get the nutrients they need or something like that. Yeah, yeah. so you, you've probably read some of these same uh, research studies. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's not particularly, um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, Catherine has another question. Is it another necessary? question, Catherine? Uh, Catherine knows all and asks a lot. <laughs> is it necessary to remove invasive plants before planting natives? Okay, so that was something I was hoping to get to, but we, we I didn't get my slides all done. Anyway, uh, there, there's, uh, I recently uh, uh, met a a woman who's working on invasive plants in the Minuteman National Park, and she's pulling out, um, and she's pulling out buckthorn. That she asked me advice. Oh boy, I you know, I, you always get it. So I went. So what I did was I looked into the literature on this, and there is a good couple of papers on buckthorn removal. And the great thing about that study was that they followed up to see what would happen, and they got really good. Um, colonization by not by native plants wherever they remove buckthorn so so I would say yeah you should it depends on the you know obviously in a knotweed stand it would be pointless to put in some spice bush or something in a dense knotweed stand you ought to clear out some of that but 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 then the question is do you want to actively plant and it at least in some of these experiments just get the plants out of the way and nature will Nature will colonize. Um, so, so I, I don't know if that was a very indirect, quite answer to your question, but um, uh, in a dense stand of invasives, you should remove first. Yes. Terrific. Thank you. And Gardener Marianne Morganti wants to know: Early on, I saw bishop's weed on your list of invasives. What is the best way to get rid of it? That's another one. I I haven't had a lot of experience with it but it's another one that is sort of infamous it's um it's just very difficult and and we had a big stand of it on the campus uh just one hillside and one year it was gone i just know our landscaper used herbicide and he is licensed so it was legal but uh there's no way he could have made it go away in one year without some pretty heavy duty herbicide. Um, if you can't use herbicide because you're working on someone else's property or in a park, that, that, that you're, really, you're illegal if you do it. You, know? you, you can only use herbicide on your own property. And some people don't use it just because they cannot stand the idea of toxins on their property. And I, I get that. Um, Eric, I remember you be, saying once, it's, that, gonna, it's just going to be very intensive year after year. You have to keep at it. And what about were you going to say, Beth? I remember you're saying once that when people had a strong reaction to using herbicides, that if they were not used in such massive doses in agriculture, 
that the very small doses that you paint on when you're working on invasives would not be significant at all. Yeah, it, it, I think part of, the, part of the reason glyphosate has such a bad reputation, you know, there's some evidence it can cause cancer, but it's in the same kind of can cause cancer group as, as beer and wine. And I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a carcinogen to the same extent as radiation or something, you know. But it's, it's, um, it's just used so heavily in agriculture. And, and, and what have we got these, you know, glyphosate insensitive crops through genetic manipulation. It's just kind of uh, makes people shudder to think of how many tons of glyphosate we put on the land. Um, and so it gives that chemical such a bad name. Yeah. Seth has a question about purple loose strife. Uh, says they are exploding in the conservation land behind my house. Should I try to introduce those beetles that work on them? How would, how would I go about doing that? That's a great question. I did actually, I was a beetle rancher for a summer and the state helped me set this up. And there still may be uh, ways to find people who can help you become a beetle rancher. And if I remember right, all of us who wanted to be beetle ranchers went to a marsh and we were given um, a bunch of uh, these um, purple loose strife plants in pots and screening. And we took our pots home and we, we screened the purple loose strife and then we introduced the beetles. So you could go out and collect the larvae of these beetles yourself, uh, do, you know, do a web search and raise them up in large numbers. Actually, I think, we've, I think we were given the adults who were, the scientists knew that it was time for them to lay eggs. We threw in adults, they laid eggs, the eggs hatched. Because the plants in our gardens were screened in our, my backyard, all the larvae survived, right? And then you end up with a zillion adults, handfuls of them <laughs> inside your netting uh, of these plants and you can toss handfuls into your infestation, they really work. I mean, if you get an infestation of those beetles going, um, you, you will, you don't, they don't eat all of the loose strife, but they, they, they bring it down to such an extent that it, it doesn't produce as much seed and it's stunted and dwarfed. And then it just becomes kind of a little well-behaved purple site in the meadow. It's actually kind of pretty in small amounts. So that's my, that I would approve of the beetle and that would be the, and, and maybe there's even an online manual of how to become a beetle rancher. <laughs> that's great, thank you. <laughs> Abby says, loving this session, we recently moved to a place that had two euonymus bushes. We uh, were able to have one removed, but the other has to stay until we can get pros in due to its location. What can I do in the meantime to make sure it isn't being spread outside that super steep corner of our yard? Wait, they, why do they have to wait to get? To I think get... because of its location. It's an oh. hard to reach area. Oh, 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 but they, they are having a hard time getting access to it. Right. Or something. Okay. So, um, uh, I guess if it's if they if they're having a hard time getting access to it to cut it, they may also be having a hard time getting access to it for other purposes. But I would just say, you know, as it's fruiting, get all the fruits off of it. Go up there and pick all the fruits. <laughs> I think I don't think they spread. I'm not sure. I don't think they spread aggressively by un, by runners. I think they're mostly a fruiter. That it, the birds eat them and then they go poop somewhere else, right? And that's the idea. Up. So if you if yeah. you can get the fruits off the plant, uh, at least you're preventing spread in your yard. But you know, here's another reason Newton should care about these things, or towns generally should care. You shouldn't. We shouldn't really be in the business of of spreading um, plants like this to all the neighboring towns. It's it's just not. Uh, very thoughtful of you know so that's another reason I I would say let's cut out our invasives at least we're doing something for the local region. Terrific. Uh, Joel says some people have argued we should never use glyphosates. Uh, in Weston we have been using it in limited applications to control invasives so I think we've, we've actually dealt with that one. 
Yeah. Um, it's, it, it has to be used responsibly and by any, any use in the parks or um, on someone else's property besides your own, you need a license and it's a chore. It's a chore to get. You need a license and insurance. Mark says, it seems like lightning bugs are on the decline. Is this in response to invasives? So, so lightning uh, fireflies, otherwise known as lightning bugs, um, are predators. They're not herbivores. And so they're larvae, they're a beetle, right? They call them uh, fireflies, but they're not a fly, they're a beetle. And their larvae live in the soil and in the leaf litter and roam around and eat little things like uh, uh, small slugs and, and, and other soft-bodied wormy things. And, um, and one of the best things you can do to, to, to help fireflies is don't rake all the leaves out from under your shrubs and, and, uh, and, and don't dump big piles of leaves in the parks either. You, you, there, there needs to be a sort of natural uh, couple inch or so of leaf litter on the ground of our parks and in our gardens and in our, uh, in our hedgerows. And that's where the firefly larvae will thrive. So, and there's some, there, I'm sure there's, you know, you know, there's firefly ecologists who really love these fireflies and, and there'll, be, there'll be more resources online of how to, uh, how to um, encourage fireflies. There were two more people. Fireflies clearly have a big fan club, but Liz okay. also says 30 years ago, we had toads as well as the fireflies. Where are they now? The toads. Um, well, uh, this would be an interesting, you know, we really got to look at rainfall and temperature over the last 30 years. The toads need vernal pools. They particularly like places where they can lay eggs in, in, in places where their tadpoles are not going to be immediately eaten by, by fish. And it would be, it would, I, I am curious to know if um, more summers are like this one over the last 30 years, where I think most vernal pools are drying up before the tadpoles have metamorphosed. So it's, it's, a, it's a concern. That would be one thing to look at for toads is, um, I guess we call that climate change. And are, are, is the warming and, and drought prevalence increasing to the point where vernal pool, the months of life that vernal pools stay wet, you know, is shortening? That would be a, a concern that we should look for. Terrific. And to go on, we've got two more bug questions. AL wants to know, how about ladybugs? Could they eat those invasive vines, leaves, and stems? So ladybugs are also predators. Those cute little ladybugs, they're assassins. <laughs> they look so sweet, but they are, they are, are carnivores. They don't eat plant. Um, they, they do eat aphids, which is great. Um, and there's, I, I can never remember all the details, but some kind of non-native ladybug was brought in as a biocontrol. A lot of gardeners bought them online and, and they have actually, there's, th there's some evidence they've displaced through competitive power our native lady, ladybugs. So that's sort of a, a side story. But no, ladybugs are, are, are little miniature cute little assassins eating aphids. Thank you. Uh, trying to see what I guess we will go next to. We'll stay with insects. One more. Uh, any idea what type of insects ate all of our vegetable plants this summer? Basil, tomatoes, sunflower, zucchini. Uh, it basically destroyed our small crop this year. Yike! And this person saw damage, but they never saw. Was this a caterpillar? Was it a grasshopper? I mean, did they see any? I wonder if they saw any uh, actual bug feeding or got a picture. That would be the way I could, uh, uh, you know, add to this question. If you had okay. a photograph, or even if you were to send me a picture of the damage they were causing, we might be able to do something with what caused it. Yeah. But, Seth yeah. says he did not see the culprits. Ah, 
but, but it history. went. What's striking is that so many different plants were affected. That's really quite remarkable. No, that's a that's a puzzle. I wish that they had. Uh, uh, maybe it was a night feeder or something that they. Yeah. The better chipmunk. No, nah, uh, chipmunks aren't that. They're not. I don't think so. They don't eat that. They're not that destructive. They're, well, they're not in such a diversity. I don't think. Catherine says rabbit. Rabbits, yeah, but this. How would you get to rabbits to harm a sunflower at a you know five foot tall giant rabbits? <laughs> well, I this summer I've had chipmunks <laughs> climbing my cherry tomato plants, the ah. very tall thin leaves, and munching the cherry tomatoes off the top. Oh, geez. It's well, you know, last fall was a major acorn year. Remember that? Yep. It was billions of acorns. And, and there, it does seem like the female chipmunks can produce a lot more offspring when they have a zillion acorns to uh, store up in the fall. And so they hibernate nice and fat and plump. And they're, they're, they're then able to have like, you know, six baby chipmunks <laughs> instead of the usual two or whatever. So I think we have a little explosion of chipmunks going on. Well, Anne has a, wants to weigh on, in on this too. She said, this year there seemed to have been lots of Asiatic beetles, uh, inv oh. invasive night beetles that eat over 100 plants. Oh, the Japanese beetle probably. Yeah, those are, I, I haven't noticed them as hyperabundant, but um, my situation in life right now, I'm not growing vegetables. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I, I've been hanging out at Weston Farms a lot, and I haven't heard of the invasive, or the Japanese beetle as a major problem, but I can ask the farmers. Okay, we're going to switch to plants. Uh, Ted wants to know, is there a good replacement plant for a stand of knotweed that has been cut back several times in the season? Jewelweed seems to do okay, but are there others that would be good to plant? So, if, if uh, I wonder if if Ted is working in Dolan, um, right in his backyard there, Dolan Pond. Is it Kuklinski, this guy? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, that guy. Wonderful. Yeah, um, the steward of Dolan. Uh, um, I would, I, we sh we, maybe I could visit over there. We could talk about it, Ted. But uh, in all those uh, damp sites, uh, it would be really neat to try some of the damp ground shrubs like um, uh, sweet pepper bush plethora and uh, the, 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 uh, the spice bush, um, uh, some of the um, winterberry, you know, the ilex, that deciduous holly. Um, yeah, we could look at a bunch of different things in there and see if, if we get some nice native shrubs uh, established. I would work with shrubs. Terrific. Rhonda would like to set, know, she said, she's read that the tree of heaven that grows on tree stumps can be killed by, I'm sorry, reading here, by mixing Epsom salts with water. Have you seen that this works? I have some that is very persistent. Ah, uh, um, I haven't tried Epsom salts. Uh, uh, you, you know, salts are persistent. They don't biodegrade. So if you're adding a lot, you're going to make a little salty patch there uh, of soil. Uh, that would be the only uh, concern I would have about that. I'd try it and report back. <laughs> okay. She also has a question about black swallowwort, uh, uh, mentioning some that grows on a neighbor's fence. And she said, is there any way, she said, uh, herbicides seem to be truly the only way to get rid of them. I yeah. I, you know, if you have a small patch, if you have like a hundred yards of fence, that, that would be very discouraging. But if you have a small patch, hand pull, hand pull four or five times a year, and then do the same the next year and the next for the next 20 years. No, I'm just kidding. It should be possible um, after, uh, if you're diligent, it should be possible to, um, to get rid of it it's multiple pullings per year for a couple years. And what you're doing is what's called the root fatigue method of biocontrol or of plant control. 
And, and the notion being that the only part that can produce food is the green part that's in the sunshine. And so if you continually remove the green part, eventually you'll kill the roots. Terrific. Uh, Joel wants to go back to the question of replacing knotweed with something native. You mentioned various bushes. What about trees to shade out the knotweed? Would that work eventually? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, knotweed does do really well in moist sites, although it's, I find it in all sorts of places. But right, uh, you, you, you will get some, uh, some control uh, shading out. Although, boy, I think about some of the places where I have knotweed, and it's in, in some cases, and especially in moist sites, it's doing just fine in the understory. Um, so I'm not so sure it's a topic, I'm not so sure you're looking to shade it out. Uh, I think you're looking to eventually really eradicate it from a site. And, and it's like the, it's like the um, uh, black swallowwort. You can do it by the root fatigue method and digging when you have a big stand, digging the roots up will give you, um, uh, you know, will 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 help you with the with that process. Now, you'll you'll you won't get rid of it by digging because the root fragments that are left in the soil will re-sprout. Every little root fragment. It's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where Mickey Mouse bangs the broom into a zillion pieces uh, in Fantasia. Every fragment comes back to life. Um, but but you can eventually. Uh, you really have to be persistent. So it's really more of a matter of getting rid of it and then um, uh, uh, sh replacing that or allowing nature to come back in. The good thing about knotweed is that once you do get rid of it, it's not bird dispersed. It's not like fruits that will fly in. And I think it's actually people dispersed. I think a lot of places where it occurs is where um, rivers have flooded and carried fragments down. So that's not people, but but in many cases, like along parking lots, it's where snow plows ripped up some uh, knotweed by mistake and carried the fragments, or, or, or a city used fill, gravelly fill, alongside a parking lot or a park and uh, carried in the knotweed roots that way. Abby has one for us for when you're not around to answer questions. She says, what tools do you recommend to identify invasives? I have tried the app's plant snap, which is oh. probably a 60% accuracy rate. No. And picture this. I can easily spend a Sunday afternoon trying to figure out if something is a pull or a keep, which is probably how I accidentally ripped up the Joe Pie weed. Ah, I'm sorry. Sorry <laughs> to hear that. No, I don't really like those apps. And, and, and I really think that the best way to... Um, you know, get a book. Books still work. <laughs> the great thing about field guides is that they aren't just, I, I view the apps as kind of like this uh, unreliable shortcut. And the great thing about field guides, and there are field guides to the invasive plants. There's websites to the invasive plants. And the great thing about these is that it includes words written words as well as pictures. And so you begin to be get you 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 begin to have familiarity with some of the features that botanists use to help you be sure of your identification of opposite and alternate leaves, of the uh, uh, you know how fuzzy the stems are, uh, where the veins of the leaves um, come out, uh, are they all from the base of the leaf or along the uh, midrib? And, and, and is the plant toothed um, or is it an entire margin to the leaf? These are the details that it isn't that, it isn't that hard, especially if you're really looking at a, like if you're a field guide to the invasive plants, that's going to be a ra rather selected, focused uh, field guide. And maybe what we five dollar there there it is a guide to invasive plants in Massachusetts five bucks we can send that out to the list after yeah it's clear. Uh, okay Al has a tricky one but what I'd be interested in knowing too how can we find sassafras seeds oh my gosh sassafras. 
so it's an it's in the avocado family and man it's it it seems to fruit only when it gets big and so <laughs> there's a there's i know of some places where there's trees and what you need to do is grow wings fly <laughs> up to the top of the tree no the, it's tricky because they seem to make fruit only when they're in full sun and it's a bright red fruit looks looks like a little avocado and um uh, in the in its shape and and birds birds are going to get there so fast that's the thing it's one of the most luscious oily rich nutritious fruits in nature so think of avocado and how oily and and rich that is it's like a entire meal you know an avocado and so these are miniatures but birds just snap them up so the answer is go to a nursery and buy a sassafras tree. there must be places where you can get sassafras trees and i wouldn't be surprised if they were somehow made from cuttings here's another idea there are some places where if you hike around in the region, you'll eventually find um, a place where there's like, you know, seedlings of sassafras. I know a few patches of it in Weston um, and uh, uh, very discreetly, I think it would be all right to take one because you're gonna foster that sassafras into a big tree. And the seedling patches I know of, there's fresh seedlings every year. So if you just take one, I think you could, I'll give you the permission. <laughs> well, we have more questions, but we promised that we would be done by 8.15. So we will save these questions and we will get them to Eric. Uh, and if you want to write to him, he is offered to answer people at eolson at brandeis.edu. Yeah, it's Olson and with the two O's, not the Swedish spelling. O-L-S-O-N. So E-O-L-S-O-N. Oh, it's right there in my picture. E-O-L-E-O-L-S-O-N at Brandeis.edu. So thank you for that offer, Eric. And this was just an amazing talk, Eric, as also. Oh, <laughs> we hope that uh, this was wonderful. We hope next uh, year we're out tromping in the woods with you. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I am uh, moving to Nicaragua. We're trying, to, we're trying to ignore that. <laughs> you you want to be all, tromping in the woods with you. <laughs> all need to come and tromp in the jungle. It'd be great to have host a whole bunch of folks from this area into the beautiful forests of Nicaragua. That's a long story, but anyway. Thank you for the invitation. I hope Thank we can you. pick you up on that. Thank you for your attention, everybody. Thank you for being here, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>